Welcome to the exam review of the actuarial profession CT6 exam paper for September 2012. I'm John Lee, a tutor at ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, we'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. For more detailed solutions, please refer to our asset, ACTED Solutions and Exam Technique, which give both model and alternative solutions as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from January 2013 from our eStore in time for students' preparation for the April 2013 exam. The first question on the paper involves decision theory, where we're asked to calculate the optimal decision using the Minimax criteria, that is, we choose the decision which has the best worst-case scenario. In the second part of the question, we're going to choose the decision which uses the Bayes criteria. And so all we have to do is work out expected losses under each of the four decisions. This kind of question has been asked so many times before that any well-prepared candidate would have easily obtained all the marks. Question 2 involves changing conditional moments to unconditional or normal moments. This will make use of the following formulae. The last time a question was asked like this was in September 2001 question 2 which can be found in our X assignment. However, after September 2001, this conditioning argument has not really been used, until fairly recently, where it's become a hot favourite amongst the examiners. This principle was used in April 2009 question 5, April 2010 question 5, and October 2011 question 7. Students take note. Question 3 asks us about simulation. Usually we have a question on the inverse transform method, or more commonly, the acceptance-rejection method. However, this question marks the first time that we've been asked to use the polar algorithm. This is actually given in the tables, and so essentially students were getting marks for copying it out. However, in the algorithm it involves V1 and V2, which come from uniform minus 1, 1 distributions. Don't forget to explain how you obtain these values. Now the polar algorithm requires that s equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared lies between 0 and 1. So essentially part 2 of the question is asking us to calculate the probability of this being the case. However, unless you take a geometric approach, you're going to run into some very sticky algebra. The wisest students will have shoved on and got their marks elsewhere. Question 4 involves fitting a Pareto distribution using the method of moments. A Pareto distribution has two unknowns, alpha and lambda, and so we will need two equations. We will simply equate the sample and model means and the sample and model variances. This is a very common question and should have presented no problems at all. In the second part, we need to calculate the median, i.e. the value of m, which is halfway through the distribution. All we have to do is use the CDF from the tables and rearrange it. After testing generalised linear models on the April paper, this time the examiners tested the exponential family, and it was a welcome return to the binomial distribution. This was last tested in September 2006 question 7, and has in fact only been tested once before that, which is April 2001 question 2. Given that there are only five distributions that we are required to show they are members of the exponential family, why students will have practised this plenty of times. Part 2 of the question asks us to state the three main components that are required when constructing a generalised linear model. Anyone who has been on tutorials will have been brainwashed that this is the distribution of the yi's, the linear predictor of the covariates that we feed into the model, and the link function that links these two things together. For part 3, the choice of link function, well you could have just looked up the canonical link function for a binomial in the tables. Part 4 will be the part which requires thinking as the log normal distribution is not a member of the exponential family. But since the normal distribution is, and the canonical link function for that is simply mu, it's not too hard to see that log of mu will be the correct answer here. This question has claim amounts and claim numbers, and so we're dealing with the collective risk model, or a compound distribution. However, since we have excess of loss reinsurance coming into play here, we're dealing with the material from Chapter 8 which combines the collective risk model with reinsurance. Finally, the question repeatedly asks us to calculate the premium's charge. This will be using the formula 
given in the ruin theory chapter that essentially we take the mean claims per unit time and add a loading factor for part two of the question we simply need the probability that the normal distribution is less than 200. however part three will be the tricky part how do we combine the probability that an individual claim is less than 200 with the number of claims that we might get in well essentially we're going to get a summation here however i suspect most students will have moved on to part four the premium charged by the reinsurer is simply the mean claims per unit time paid by the reinsurer add on its loading factor however e of sr will require us to calculate the mean claim amount paid by the reinsurer on one claim often denoted by e of z however the claim amounts unusually follow a normal distribution this has only been asked once before in September 2010, question 10. As long as students remembered the truncated formula for the normal distribution in the tables, they would have been fine. Had they not, they would have got themselves in a pickle. And part five asks us to calculate the profit, i.e. the net premium kept by the insurer after the reinsurer has taken their bite, take away the average claims paid by the insurer. Part seven was testing the basic chain ladder and these first seven marks would have been a gift to any student. However, in part two of the question, we were asked to work with fitted payments. The last time these were asked were in September 2002, question seven, which is included in our Q&A bank three. Essentially what you do is use your cumulative development factors on your initial claims to see what we would have expected in those years and then compare them to the actual. The steps are fairly simple. The problem would have been whether students remembered this. In question 8, part 1, we have a Poisson distribution and some claims data, and we're asked to determine the maximum likelihood estimate. Essentially, we know this is going to be the mean. However, for our five marks, we're going to have to show some working. This is a very standard question and should have presented no problems at all. For question 8, part 2, we get to apply the EBCT, but for the first time since this has come back in the syllabus, we get to do model 2. Students in tutorials would have been warned of this for quite some time and hopefully would have done their preparations accordingly. Essentially, all we're going to do is take these numbers and stick them in the formula in the tables, which should have been an easy six marks. And part three asks us to explain the difference between maximum likelihood estimation in part one and the EBCT in part two. The key feature being that EBCT just works with data and makes no distributional assumptions. And now we come to the last two questions, which cause the most grief to students. Question nine, test time series. In the first part, we're asked to apply a seasonal difference to transform this into a stationary time series. Well, given that this is equal to one minus the backward shift operator to the power of S times XT, it should have been fairly easy to notice that S is three. And by applying this, it will strip out this factor from the time series which leaves us with an AR2. Students who didn't pick this up would have found it almost impossible to get anywhere with the algebra in part two. Moving on to part two, we need to estimate the parameters alpha and beta. The way we do this is to use a method of moments. So we need to calculate the true values of row one and row two and set them equal to our observed sample values. Obtaining expressions for row one and row two is the bread and butter of any time series question and should have presented well-prepared candidates no problems. However, solving the equations was a little bit more ugly, and hence the need for the examiners to give this hint. The last part of the question doesn't actually rely on previous parts. And so even if you couldn't complete part two, hopefully you could have picked up some fairly easy marks by simply rearranging the defining equation and substituting in t is 101 and then t is 102. Our final question in the paper involves ruin theory, adjustment coefficients, and reinsurance. It's a beast of a question. However, it's also very similar to September 2002, question five. In part one, we need to find the smallest value of the retention to ensure the company makes a profit. Well, this is gonna be using the same formula as we used in question six. We require the net premium kept by the insurer after the reinsurer takes its bite to be greater than the net claims kept by the insurer. In part two, we need to get the adjustment coefficient equation 
for the insurance company. Well, usually this is lambda plus the premium times the adjustment coefficient equals lambda times the MGF of the claims with the adjustment coefficient as the parameter. But when reinsurance is involved, we now have the net premium and the MGF of the net claims. For part three, we need to calculate this adjustment coefficient when M is four. This will basically involve trial and error, or those who've got a Casio FX85 ES or better can just use the table mode. And if you know anything about adjustment coefficients, you'll know the value's fairly small, so try values between zero and one. In part four of the question, we're now looking at proportional reinsurance. Well, the easiest way of obtaining the same premium is to show that they must have the same mean claim amount, which shouldn't have presented too much problem if you made it this far and didn't run out of time. In part five, we're going to compare adjustment coefficients, but all we have to do is show whether it's higher or lower. So by substituting in M is four and getting our appropriate alpha, we can then use that to get the net premiums and the net claims, and then obtain our adjustment coefficient equation. However, we simply need to check our value of R is smaller. We don't need to solve this explicitly. Part six is the classic compare adjustment coefficients. As long as you remember that the adjustment coefficient is a measure of security or inverse measure of risk, then a bigger R will result in a lower probability of ruin. If you wish to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.acted.co.uk forward slash forums.